Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at a game from round six of the Altbox Norway Chess Tournament 2020. On the white end, Ari Antari, and he's paired against Ali Reza Ferruja. So let's hop right in. Tari opening with e4, Ferruja replying with the Karo Khan defense. We have an exchange Karo. And when you're playing this defense, what is one of your main objectives, if not the main objective? It is to deploy your light square bishop outside your pawn chain. So white reacts and now hits black where they're a bit weak. That's defended. And h3 follows. Something to quickly note, sometimes there can be moves like this to pull the queen away from its defensive b7 with the idea to next take the knight pawn and then the rook. It's not working here because that's mate. Anyhow, sometimes this can be an idea. In this game, it's h3, an early commitment with the king side pawn. Flight square for the king. More short term, this guy on g4 has to do something. So quick pop quiz, where should the bishop where should the bishop go? h5 or d7? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, in the game, bishop d7. This was the first moment that grabbed my attention when I skimmed through this game. I thought to myself, bishop h5. If this was, let's say, a bullet game, this would be my knee-jerk reaction. The issue with bishop h5 is that white can go hunting for a pawn. g4, trade bishops, and give this knight a boot from its defensive d5. White wins a pawn. It's not the end of the day. Black can react energetically in the center, breaking with e5. White only has one piece out and has made several kingside concessions, but still... A pawn is a pawn. Okay, in this game it's bishop d7. Some natural moves coming in. And after this ninth move e6, I feel like white can be a bit happy. Uh, happy that black has not achieved this objective to deploy the light square bishop outside of the pawn chain. It's inside. Continuing, rook on a half open file. Battery is formed, and e7 is left vacant for a knight. This can often be a nice pivot towards the king side. Maybe f5 or g6. I think this next move by white looks to try and take advantage of this decision to put the bishop on d6 rather than e7. Uh, with the bishop on e7, uh, black would have no concerns whatsoever about this possibility to take the knight uh, because black would be able to recapture with the piece and keep the structure as is. So what does black play at this moment? How to, how to deal with this possibility? Black castles. Has no worries about a damaged kingside structure. Why is that? In general, not a good idea to have your kingside damaged and the queen still be on board. But there isn't a way to take advantage of these weaknesses that would be created after this move. In the game, knight d2 is played. If white goes forward with this, f6, h6, h5 are all weakened. But how do you make use of those squares? You don't. Soon, it'll be black who goes on the offensive, throwing the king in the corner, stacking the rooks on the g-file. Good luck to white, weathering that storm. A move such as queen c2 is not really a threat at all. The king could go in the corner. This pawn would be poison. White will now lose a piece. Okay. No bishop takes knight. Both sides now connecting the rooks. Knight h5. This was the first think by Ferruja. About five minutes spent on knight to h5. A black knight 
on the F4 square is a real beast. Two checks in mind, has some nice pressure on the kingside pawns. Tough to work around, tough to control F4 with a pawn. Now that H3 is in, if G3 is played, White would just be asking for some sacrifice with the queen and bishop, as well as the knight keying in on that square. So you just have to work around a knight on f4. Queen d1, hinting at maybe a knight move, generating a threat on h5. f6 follows. It's committal. The diagonal is a bit more weakened towards the king. e6 is sensitive. But I believe at the end of the day, the positives are outweighing the negatives. What are these positives? Well, first of all, let's get a couple more moves in. Bishop e3, knight f4, and bishop to f1. What do I see? What sticks out to me most about this position? It is the quality of the knights. The black knights stand very well. Both are in the key 16 squares of the board. The white knights, uh, this guy is out of bounds. The knight on d2 is under control by the pawn on d5. And even though the white knight on f3 is inside this key area, it is under control by that f6 move. This is the main positive I'm seeing behind this advance. Uh, I guess we can say the c3 pawn does a good job of controlling the knight on c6. But the knight on c6 has at least a useful role in supporting if black wants to uh, play this uh, that knight supports a central break e5 uh, this is the biggest factor i see about this position the quality of the knights i believe the black knights far outweigh the white knights black has nice control over this position and I believe it's Black's control over this position that gives him the confidence to make this next move, this highly committal move, g5. Many weaknesses are created now on the king side. Black has a clear idea in mind with this move. It's very cavemanish. Black's ready to throw the king in the corner, put the rook on g8, and then break with g4 and go after the king. A very clear idea, but it is not so clear how you defend against it. White has a tall task ahead of him. Okay, this knight, first of all, if you try to get rid of him with g3, well, White isn't even threatening to win material with g3. So if you're going to make a committal move such as g3, you ought to be generating a threat. You ought to really be threatening to win some material. Uh, white wouldn't be threatening to win material. Let's just say king here. If you take the knight, where's that bishop going? Nowhere. Black gets the material right back, and whoa. Rook g8 is hitting really fast with check. Okay, so no g3. We have a thematic reply, c4. You play in the flanks, your king is now weakened. Okay, let's break it open in the center. Let's open a diagonal or two. Let's maybe get some tempo against your queen. Here I, here I go. c4 it is, king h8, rook c1, rook g8. Nearby, g4. This knight, white deems it as intolerable at this stage, so some concession removing this knight on f4 bishop takes knight an imbalance is on board now how exactly should black recapture i'll throw this one to you as a pop quiz bishop takes bishop or pawn takes bishop feel free to pause the video okay in the game bishop takes bishop maybe tempting to want to immediately peel open this file for this rook, or really both rooks. But these guys would be shut out of the game with this pawn fixed, basically, on f4. There's no guarantee that this knight moves, so it's basically a fixed pawn. Um, 
Black wants it all. And what I mean by that is he wants to keep this diagonal opened and still crack open the G file. It's just a moment away. G4. And the G file will open. So this is the unopposed bishop. Has very nice influence over the board, pinning the knight. Its eyes are open. The queen's eyes are opened. Continuing, we have b4. So this was one of the ideas behind this capture on f4 at this stage. It was to pull away the bishop from seeing b4. Uh, something to maybe note at this stage is that, you know, this a3 move is the top one of the top moves by the engine. But this is anything but human. Uh, I would be really surprised to see a human go with the a3 move at this stage. Its idea to support b4, it just comes off as far too slow. You know, the, the king side is soon to be on fire, and it almost feels like you're passing. You, you're making a nothing move with a3. So... In capturing this knight, at least going for some forceful variation, this is far more human-like um, to take on f4, going for a forcing line, and then following up with b4, which is actually generating a serious threat. The threat here to take on d5 and then take advantage of what would be a pinned knight. So black gets out of any pin with queen d6. The knight is kicked away. The pressure on d4 is now released, some. c5 follows. One of the suggestions is some kind of rook lift with the intention to lend some lateral defense uh, on the third rank. g3 is, a, is soon to be a sensitive point. Okay, but in this game it is c5. So there is a majority that's been created, but this is hitting really, really fast. Queen c7 g3 what is the reaction by black how would you play at this stage feel free to pause the video okay here we go a big moment in the game the bishop's attacked it doesn't budge in fact it doesn't budge for several moves to be captured for several moves doesn't budge for several moves the reaction here is g4 the break is in there all of these prep moves have been played. G5, king in the corner, rook G8. You have to justify all of those moves. You have to get the break in. It's in. No time to take the bishop because the knight falls with check and queen takes F4. Good luck. No luck can help white here. All right, so no pawn takes bishop. Instead, pawn takes pawn. Rook takes. Bishop h3, the rook falls back, not just to any square, keeps g8 vacant for the other rook. Simply can't take now. It's a pin, so white is out of the pin and also stays off of h2. You'd really be asking for trouble here. There'd be a sacrifice on g3. e5 as the follow-up, hitting an unprotected bishop. And they're traded. No time to take the bishop here because it would be a checkmate in two. So what's played is knight to h2. Where's this guy go? Nowhere. Queen h3, no time to take the bishop yet again because of mate on g2. Rook g1, the rooks are now stacked. Can you take the bishop now? No. Still no good. Queen e2 is played. If you take the bishop, there would follow rook g2. This is a problem. And what do you do here? If knight to f3, there can follow e4, kicking the knight away from defense of h2. White's position collapses. So the bishop remains poison. Queen e2 e4, now there is simply no knight f3. Same story if this, rook to g2. Uh, rook to g2, if the knight goes to f1 to defend, that's mate. The rooks are disconnected. 
Okay, so after e4, what do we have? Rook to c3, adding some support over g3. But now, uh, after knight to f5, both knights, first the one on f4 created a serious concession in white's camp. White parted ways with their dark square bishop, and now this one is entering the scene with devastating effect, hitting d4 and looking to crash through on g3. Maximal pressure on g3. All pieces pointing at uh, the g3 pawn. White at this stage lashes out, um, captures on e4. There is no good solution, unfortunately, for white here. After the recapture, we have queen takes e4, and it should be no surprise, an accident is going to happen in this intersection. g3, intersection square, bishop takes first. If you take this bishop, the knight pounces in the game rook g2. So if pawn takes, there would follow knight takes g3 check. You have to take now. And white, or excuse me, black crashes right through. How do you stop queen g2 or g1 for mate next? You don't, really. You have to give away even more material. And this is, of course, toast for white. So what is played is rook g2. The back rank is now a bit weakened. The rooks have taken some steps up, so black transfers his attention to the e-file. Rook e7 has the support of the knight. Queen defends the back rank. Black insists. And white resigns. There's no good solution to rook e1. Uh, leading to the win of more material or some type of checkmate sequence. So I'll show one variation, one or two variations. If, let's say, rook to c1, there can follow bishop takes knight. Yeah, I'll just go with this one variation. Bishop takes knight, rook takes. Queen f3 check. King g1. Some rook to the g file. King f1. And that's mate. So this is simply too much to weather for white, and he threw in the towel. So a very nice game. Uh, Feruja playing the Karo Khan and winning in 34 moves with this early launching of the G-Pawn, only at a moment, though, where he had very nice control in the center. Uh, something I'd like to point out is in this early stage, I think an improvement will be right around here to, uh, an improvement would be to not deploy the bishop, but rather say my queen did her job, this a3, you know, mission accomplished with ensuring the bishop is still inside the pawn chain. A better idea would be queen d2 and queen to e2, strengthening control over e5 looking to pivot there with the knight and put the other one on f3. Anyhow, I, I share all of that uh, with the assistance of my good friend, Stockfish12. But this would be a, uh, an improvement, is what I'm getting at, instead of the bishop g5, which turned out to really backfire. Some nice tempi were gained, about, uh, were gained against the bishop on g5. Okay. Once more after Rook here, White resigned. Let's have one look here at the tail of the tape. Here we go. We could see how it plays out. So right here after Bishop to D6, that's where there was a big drop with Bishop G5. Uh, it does go back up a little bit for White, but you have to really be completely... Like it's super accurate with your defensive moves, really tough to find. This was right around the point I was saying that a3 was considered best instead of taking the knight, but yeah, no, no human is really going to play a3 there, I don't think. And it just goes downhill at the end of the day. Where do we stand? Average centipawn loss for uh, 
Ariantari 49 to Ferruja's 18. Uh, I didn't share this with you yet, but these were the show a couple pictures at the end here. This is right around the point where G4, G5 was on board. A couple pictures of these guys in action, both of them very concentrated. Um, yeah, so a very tight game, uh, a very tense game, I should say, and a nice, nice idea implemented by Ferruja in this one, 34 move win with the Carol Khan. Anyhow, as usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.